If you're familiar with club football, you know that no two stadiums are designed the same. But why do a lot of Italian stadiums share that same look? You know the look. Oval-shaped grandstands at the end of either side of the pitch with seats a fair distance away from where the action is? The easy answer is obvious. There's a track around the pitch. Sure, that's pretty common. In fact, you'll see that design in practically every country, no matter the continent. Italy has a lot of stadiums with this design, though. Whether they try to hide it or not is one thing, but it's definitely different from English stadiums where fans can basically spit on the pitch. So why are these designs so prominent here? There's an easy answer to all this, but this easy answer represents an underlying issue that simply can't be ignored from those involved in Italian football. Before we get into that underlying issue, let's quickly dive into why tracks around football pitches are so common in Italy. And while you're here, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, as it goes a long way. Unlike other countries where football clubs own their stadium in one way, shape, or form, not a lot of Italian clubs can say the same. Instead, it's far more customary for municipalities to own the grounds. And when these municipalities poured public funding into building these stadiums in the early to mid 20th century, they prioritize a multi-purpose design that can accommodate community sports and entertainment. So with that in mind, having municipal ownership alleviated financial pressure on the clubs, allowing them to invest in other areas of the sport without the headache of managing and financing a giant arena. This is why it's incredibly common for two clubs to share the same ground, because it was, and still is, an affordable and convenient option as well as being ingrained in Italian football tradition. There's a pattern here though. Clubs are playing in stadiums they don't own and that don't fit the mold of a modern football ground. This pattern and structure of stadium management has held back these clubs from competing with teams from other countries financially, contributing to the decline in popularity of Italian football compared to its peak in the 1990s and early 2000s. Let me outline how the system backfired on Italian football. Let's start with the 1990 World Cup. In hindsight, Italia 90 came at an awkward time for Italy in the lens of football stadium design. 12 stadiums across the country were selected as venues for the major tournament, which is already more than usual. Prior to the event, each venue needed significant renovations, whether through expanding capacity, roof installations, or improving its facilities. Not to mention two entirely new stadiums needed to be built. This project became expensive to say the least, with it costing 84% over budget. The 1990 World Cup also happened at a time where stadiums were transitioning to a more modern design that can better accommodate its fans. Following the Hazel disaster of 85 and the Hillsborough disaster of 89, it became a priority for stadiums across Europe to change their design to emphasize fan safety. So clubs who owned their own grounds swiftly built state-of-the-art arenas better fit for fan experience. Italian clubs and their local governments, on the other hand, face an enormous amount of debt from their previous renovations for the World Cup resulting in a lack of financial resources available to make significant changes on stadiums the clubs didn't even own. And even if there was money available to build a new stadium, the process of securing public funding through local governments already facing debt just added more obstacles in the way. Some clubs were able to escape their outdated stadiums. Stadio delle Alpi, a relatively new ground built specifically for the 1990 World Cup, was abandoned by both Torino FC and Juventus in 2006 just prior to the Winter Olympics of that year. Because the construction of the ground was partially funded by the Italian Olympic Committee, who demanded there be a track around the pitch, fans of both turn-based clubs detested the layout with there being poor visibility. And it's not surprising since the architect of the ground admitted to have never watched a football match before in his life. Because of this, as well as high running costs, both clubs returned to their previous stadium, Stadio Olimpico Gran Torino. Stadio delle Alpi wouldn't even last two decades as it was eventually demolished by Juventus to make way for their privately owned stadium, demonstrating how quickly a new stadium's design at the time can quickly become outdated. As mentioned earlier, municipal ownership of stadiums and sporting arenas can have a lot of upsides. However, being dependent on public money can significantly hold the club back. During the peak of Italian football in the 1990s, Italy's economy went through a rough patch with it having one of the highest public debt in the world at the time. This forced governments to be far more selective as to where they commit their spending, and as a result, public infrastructure like stadiums were neglected from repairs and renovations even during the high times of Syria. This economic slowdown in the country had a long drawn out effect on Italian clubs. In an ultra-competitive league like Serie A, the only way for clubs to compete is to spend money on players, 
and most of the high ticket transfers in the 90s were spent by Serie A clubs. The cost of doing business caught up with the league as clubs continued to rack up loads of debt in a time where the entire country was trying to cut back on spending to alleviate the debt already accumulated. This led to financial mismanagement by clubs, including risky practices like leveraging TV rights revenue as collateral for loans. More importantly though, modern stadiums make a significant difference in match day revenue, and that's a lever hardly pulled in Italy, barring a couple examples. Look at Juventus. They built Allianz Stadium in 2011 and immediately generated a 282% increase in match day revenue compared to when they played in Stadio Olimpico. Better fan experience means more bums in seats, and like most modern stadiums, luxury boxes bring in a wealth of money for clubs and that type of accommodation just isn't possible in stadiums built half a century ago. To put it in perspective, in 2019, the total match day revenue of La Liga's big three clubs was 138% more than that of Serie A's three biggest clubs, Juventus, Inter, and Milan. England's highest earners of match day revenue from that same year, Manchester United, Liverpool, and Arsenal, generated 114% more than the three Italian giants. This disparity in income can be felt around the rest of the league as well. On top of match day income, opening a new ground can see a rise in commercial revenue through hospitality suites, digital signage, or even venue rentals for non-footballing events. It presents new opportunities for clubs, or local governments in this case, to add a variety of ways to bring in money outside of match day income and player sales if it's creative enough. Serie A clubs are being suppressed by their own stadiums while desperate for a lifeline, and the product on the pitch is demonstrating that. As Serie A entered the new millennium, club after club ran into significant financial issues. Combine the poor monetary state of the league with an increase of violence from ultras, along with a major scandal from the league's most prominent clubs, sponsors avoided Serie A like the plague. A World Cup win couldn't even save the country's top division from falling behind to the likes of the Premier League and La Liga. The beginning of the 1990s saw stars like Maradona, Maldini, Baggio, and Del Piero represent the world's best league. By 2010 though, while there were still elite figures in Serie A, the best players in the world weren't as concentrated in Serie A like they were in the decades prior. The league simply lost its glamour with the glory days well in the rearview mirror, as its UEFA country ranking dropped from first in 1999 to fourth just 12 years later. The league's spending got outpaced as well. Between 1990 and 2000, Syria had the highest transfer balance in the world. From 2010 to 2020, however, that position dropped to the third highest, indicating other leagues are outspending them in the transfer market. And after COVID came and went, it seems like the gap between Syria and the top, which is clearly the Premier League, is only going to get wider. According to Deloitte's Money League, which ranks clubs on how much revenue they generated, only three Italian clubs earned the top 30 earners from the 2021-22 season, with 16 of the 30 teams coming from England. If you build it, they will come. It's always easier said than done, especially when it's as administrative as it is in Italy. But there is a runway for potential. In 2019, a movement was passed into law to make the bureaucratic process of stadium development far more efficient than it was in the past through tax incentives, simplified administrative procedures, and flexibility of land use, among other features. Clubs like Fiorentina, Inter, and Milan all have plans for major renovations or new stadiums as a whole. Italian clubs have also slowly been taking their stadiums into their own hands since 2002, with Juventus, Udinese, Sassuolo, and Atalanta being the only teams in Serie A to own their own ground. It may not be up to par with other leagues around Europe, but it's hard to ignore the intent to change the status quo in the country. Italian football still has work to do. Disputes involving municipalities and clubs will persist, fans will complain about the decaying architecture in their club's historically significant ground, and Serie A won't spend like clubs from the Premier League. But with the stature of a few clubs compiled with the efforts to adapt their stadiums into modern venues, we might see Italy climb that UEFA country ranking with the next Maradonas of the world fleeing to the San Siro or Stadio Olimpico. A modernized stadium can be the answer to turn this giant sinking ship around. Improved visibility for fans, new revenue streams, up-to-date facilities, it's something everyone can enjoy. The hurdle is the regional politics that could change the course of action at the drop of a hat. Change is definitely coming, how long it will be is another question. If all this happens, we may have to say goodbye to the infamous multi-purpose stadiums that continue to die off in sports. Some clubs may have to part ways with their local rivals acting as their roommate, and when that day comes, it'll be the death of the track around the pitch. 
but at least the fans can let the players know how they really feel. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, and don't forget to subscribe.